Uh, thanks everybody for dialing in today. Um, my name is Joel Ben. Most of you will have heard me rambling about releases before. Um, today I'm going to go through release 15, which we put out last week. Um, and you can see the title there is Project Falling Water, which is what we've sort of dubbed inside Anne says release 15. Um, and I'll go into a little bit of background about it and then we'll get started in, into the actual um, interface itself. Release 15, so Project Falling Water. Now, um, there was quite a few aims behind uh, Project Falling Water, but the main one, which you can see on the screen, was to improve the Research Data Australia user experience by focusing more on the needs and behaviours of typical users, um, which we identified as primarily researchers. So um, up until the release 15, we've really been focusing on getting content into the registry and Research Data Australia. And now we're sort of switching gears a little bit and trying to focus more on what the researchers want and, and how we can deliver that in, in the best way. So that was really uh, the main aim behind Project Falling Water, which we started last year. Um, just a little bit about the plan. Um, the first sort of uh, few blocks here, um, how we went about it. So we captured the, the strategic directions for ANS and what they wanted um, to see in Research Data Australia and where they wanted it to go in the future. We then looked at capturing user inputs. So we interviewed, I think it was about 17 um, researchers. So that's uh, researchers themselves, um, PhD students and other people that are in that sort of research sector. Um, and then we went through the task of documenting the requirements and then sort of followed a fairly uh, standard um, software development life, life cycle. In the sort of area when we were capturing the user inputs and looking at documenting the requirements, we actually got an external um, user experience company in um, to help us with really focusing our efforts in the, the short time frame that we had. Now, coming out of those early stages was one of the key uh, user journeys that we discovered and we really wanted to focus Research Data Australia down onto, and that was uh, the searching, the filtering, and then evaluating, and then accessing the data. So a lot of the researchers that we spoke to really wanted to be able to find what they were looking for quickly and, and get to the data really easily. So that's sort of um, the journey that we were focusing on in the, in the new interface in Research Data Australia. Um, so what was included, um, as a lot of you have probably already seen, it was a complete rewrite of Research Data Australia portal. Um, so it's got a new look and feel. Um, so it will take a few uh, few days or so to get used to the new look and the, the features that are in it. The new focus is for data, data centric. Um, so we're trying to make sure that when users come to Research Data Australia, they're finding data. So in the earlier stages of Research Data Australia, when you did a search, you would get all sorts of objects coming back. You'd get activities, you'd get uh, party records, you'd get services. A lot of those weren't described yeah, very richly, so you'd sometimes get party records which would just have a name. And this was quite confusing to new users coming either via Google or from a reference um, to Research Data Australia. They were looking for data and they were getting all these other objects that they weren't sure what they were. So we've tried to really focus the flow on uh, obtaining and accessing data um, through Research Data Australia. Um, so we've obviously improved the search and the search interface as part of the release. We've implemented a new advanced search feature. Um, contributor pages for every group. So this is a big one for um, contributors. So in the past, it was an opt-in feature to have a contributor page. Um, so what we've done for this release is we've auto-generated a contributor page for everybody, and then the contributors can go in and actually edit those and, and add information about themselves and, and details. The contributor page CMS, so again on the contributor pages, in the past you would generate your contributor pages from the registry. We've actually moved that process over into the portal, so there's a new CMS in the portal where you can actually edit and publish um, contributor pages. A separate but integrated custom search interface for grants and projects. So as I was talking about before, we've really focused down on, on finding data and accessing data in Research Data Australia. We're also one of the only places that sort of aggregates information about funded grants and projects. So we, we didn't want to lose that um, aspect of Research Data Australia. So we've put a, a almost like a sub portal in Research Data Australia for finding grants and projects. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail later. Um, My RDA, so this is a feature where you can have an account in Research Data Australia where you can save searches and uh, records for later viewing. So you, if you're you know, a PhD, PhD student um, and you're doing some research, you can come back and check for new results over a, a period of time with your saved searches. Or if you're interested in specific records, you can save those to come back and you know, access the data or cite them later on. Um, the new record view, so we've, we've obviously revamped that and it has a prominent access, 
access section. So in the past, we had a very little URL that sort of pointed off to either a landing page or where you can directly download the data, but it wasn't quite clear on where you could actually get to the data. So we've put a big section, um, which I'll show you in the view page, which is, is pretty clear to users, hopefully. Um, and improve suggested data sets. So some of you will be uh, familiar with the and suggested data sets in the old Research Data Australia. We've put a new algorithm in place to, to try and um, provide five relevant data sets to one that you're looking at, um, just to try and, uh, I guess, provide another finding aid or another option if they've come to a record that's not quite what they want, they might see something in the suggested data sets that they can navigate onto. So I'll flick over into test. So this is the new homepage for Research Data Australia. Um, you can see straight away that we have, um, so straight away we've got the, the data up front, which telling users what they can do on the site. So they're, they're finding data for research. And they have a big bold search bar, um, which prompts users on, on what the main sort of activity is in Research Data Australia. And then underneath that, we have some additional finding aids. Um, if you're obviously not searching, you want to browse by subjects. So we have eight subjects that you can browse by. Um, excuse the display, it's because I've zoomed in. They're all pushed over and, and bundled up. Um, and then down the bottom, we have uh, some additional finding aids for other things that are in Research Data Australia. Um, so we have the theme collections. So we've had themes for quite some time. So they've still got a place um, in Research Data Australia and you can access them from the Explore section. We also have a couple of pages um, highlighting specific data and tools. So we have the services and tools here that could be of interest to researchers uh, looking to you know, process certain things or access online services where they can get to data. And a real highlight on open data, so data that is reusable and easily accessible. Um, so there's, there's also a page um, highlighting open data. And as I spoke about before, there's the grants and projects portal, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail later. And then like on the old Research Data Australia, we have a section on who contributes, who finds data, it's Research Data Australia. Um, so one of the goals we had for this release was to try and get logos for all our data providers to jazz up the site a little bit and provide some you know, promotion and um, you know, quality to the records from data providers. Um, so we still have a page which shows everybody and this is just a little carousel that flicks through to give some indication of the, the records that we have in Research Data Australia. So the, the main goal, I guess, is, is conducting a search in Research Data Australia. Um, and it, it's very much the, the functionality is, is very similar to the previous version. Um, we have a big bold search bar. All you need to do to do a search is just type in your search term and click the search button. What we have introduced, though, is a drop down at the start of the search bar, which allows you to refine straight off the, off the bat um, what, where you want to look in a record. Um, so by default, we're looking in all fields for a record. Um, we can then refine that to search within just the title, the description, in the ident any identifiers for a record. So if you know an identifier for a grant or you know a DOI for a collection or a data set, um, you can search directly in the identifier fields. Any related people, so if you want to just search for a researcher that may have had, you know, it may have been the principal investigator for a collection, you can select that option or related organizations, which probably will get used a little bit less than the others. Um, so for now, I'll just do a search for, for water. I just click search and that brings us back, brings us into the search results. Now, some sections in the search results. We have the section, uh, the search results header up the top here. You can see how many results were returned, how fast it was. Uh, the records selected, the save records and export, I'll go into those in a minute. Um, and then your sorting and display options. So we can sort by uh, the relevance, which is obviously how highly it's ranked against your search, and the title of the record, A to Z, Z to A, and then the date added in descending order. And that comes into play when you've got saved searches, or if you're just looking to see if there's something new for your search that you've, you've previously run. And the show option obviously allows you to to change the number of search results that are displayed on a single page and your pagination, which is shown underneath, will obviously change according to that. Um, in terms of refining a search, so over on the left-hand side, um, we have switched, obviously, in the previous version of RDA, we had them on the right, um, but we got a lot of feedback and it is fairly standard on other sites like shopping sites, etc., that you find the filters on the left. So we've shifted them over to the left. Um, we have a current search section 
which highlights your current search. So all the filters you've applied, the search terms that you've applied, all in one area, which you can obviously remove items. Um, and you can also review the, the search that you've done. And that was one thing that we got back from researchers that sort of participated in our interviews, that there was a real disconnect about the search bar, what they'd actually search for, and then what they're actually doing within the search results. So that's the current search section. Um, underneath that, you have the filters. Um, so we have an additional keyword. So if we just wanted to add an additional keyword to our search within the search um, results that we have, we can just add a keyword, and that's obviously added rain to my search results. Um, underneath that, we have the subjects. So these, by default, in the, the search view, and I'll go into this a little bit later, is the ANZ um, FOR top levels. And on the home page, those subject um, icons that I showed before, the pictures, they're actually mapped to uh, some of the ANZ codes. So if you clicked on one of those, you actually get a search, which sometimes maps to a single ANZ code, and other times it'll, it'll map to multiple. Underneath that, we have the data providers, so you can narrow down your search by a certain provider. Um, we have the access, so whether it's restricted, open, conditional, um, the licenses, uh, the license types that are, that are assigned to the data and um, time period, so the temporal range on the data set and the location. Um, what I'll do is I'll just clear this search and just do a default search so we can see all the options there. Um, so we have the restriction, restricted, conditional um, and open. Local will actually go very soon and be um, put into unknown. So this is just in the test environment. Um, and the map search. So the map search um, we had before is its own sort of entity sitting off. Um, there's still a link under the search bar. There was a real disconnect between the general search in Research Data Australia and the map search, and the users were really struggling to, to find the connection between the two and how they could filter down um, on their map searches. So one of the items, one of the things that we've put in is we've actually included the map search in the general flow. Um, so there will be additional work on getting a little mini-map here in the future, um, but for now it opens into the advanced search um, box and you can do your map searches in here. And I'll go into the advanced search in just a second. The next thing I just wanted to, to go into was understanding the search results. So you can see here I've done a search without any search terms, and what you get back is a title for the record, for each record. Underneath that is the data provider, so this is my testing data, so JB test data, but underneath that you can see Atlas of Living Australia here. So that's who provided the data. And then underneath that you get a snippet of the brief description or any description if there's no brief description there. But when I've actually done a search with some search terms, so I'll put your search again for water, we actually have in context uh, highlighting of your search terms and where that's discovered within the record, the index fields for the record. So you can see that I've done a search for water, and you can see that water's been highlighted a couple of times in the description in the related organisations at the bottom here. So at the end of each of the snippets, you'll see in brackets where it's actually been discovered. So this is a way for users to really assess and evaluate records. Um, they may have searched for something like ice, and it's come up something in, in a subject which were, they were looking for it somewhere more descriptive in the title or in the, in the description. And for each context snippet, we, we display two entries. So you can see that there's water has been found at least twice in the description. So we have two description um, snippets, and we've also got two related organization, organization snippets underneath. So that's, that's basically the makeup of the search results. Um, and obviously, you can find things that are also in subjects, in identifiers, and you'll get those shown in snippets as well. So hopefully, that's quite useful to users. The advanced search, which is a link under the, the search bar, you can access that from any page which has a search bar in Research Data Australia. You can also access it, well, we also use it for filtering and refining your search. So one of the features that we've, we've put in for this release is being able to select um, multiple filters in the same category. So this is something that's been requested um, by a number of users in the past, and we've been working towards getting that in. So for release 15, we have put that in. So for example, if I wanted to uh, look for records from two data providers, I'll select AODN to start with. And then you'll see that the options have been filtered down. So the filters on the left show you the filters that are available for your search results. So because I've got uh, AODN selected, the only search results that I've got back are for AODN. The only options I can choose are obviously AODN. 
But if I wanted to add extra or additional data providers, I can click on the view more button and I'll get access to all the other data providers that have something to do with my search. So I can just go and select multiple and then click search. And you'll see over in my current search, I now have four data providers selected and the search results will obviously be collections or, or data sets from those uh, four providers. So the advanced search is used obviously for filtering and also for constructing um, advanced searches. So that, that will take users a little while to get their head around, I think. Um, but once they start using it, it's, it's fairly straightforward. So the advanced search, as I said, is available from any of the pages with a search button. And we've constructed it in a way that you can construct quite a complex query all in the same process or flow. So from the filters on the left, you have a, a number of tabs where you can go and add um, all of these different filters to your search before actually clicking search. There's no defined order to the tabs. Um, you can put them in any order. I can put a license in first and then put my search terms in, etc. But what you need to know is that when you make a selection on a tab, so let's say I, I select um, through license, when I click on a data provider tab, that will actually update to reflect all those data providers which have collections with that license that I've selected. So each time I make a selection and then move on, the, the numbers of subjects, etc., will be updated. So you can see here most of them are zero, um, there's some that are two, to reflect that search that I'm building as I go. And at any stage, you can click on the review tab just to come down the bottom to see um, what I've actually constructed in the advanced query. You can see a preview of the three results, and then you can either click the search here or the search down the bottom. The search terms for those who participated in the beta testing and the UAT testing, um, we got we had a different version of this advanced query interface. It was it worked quite well, but it was quite complex and it took users a lot of time to get their head around on actually what we were trying to achieve. Um, so for the release 15, we've simplified, simplified it quite a bit. Um, we will be doing additional work in the future to jazz it up just that little bit more. Um, but it is, still, it is still quite functional. So in terms of building a, a, an advanced query, I have those fields that were available uh, with the search bar, so I can do quite a complex query where I want to search for water in the title, and then within actually the description, I'd like to find something with flood. And then you can use the add row to build up your query as you go. And the one thing that is probably a little strange is the Boolean operators between your query rows actually change all Boolean operators. So you can see I've selected all there and it's changed the one underneath. And if I had multiple rows, it would do the same. And this is one of the constraints that we have um, with the underlying system, but we'll be looking to enhance that feature where you can mix and match the Boolean um, operators in, in your queries. Um, in terms of removing anything from your query, there's just a little X at the end. You can, you can remove, remove the rows and then run your search. So the other filters that are available are the same as what's available in the search, but obviously you can select multiple um, from the filters. So I can select multiple subjects. Uh, data provider is the same. Um, time period I didn't go into before. Um, this is basically was the temporal coverage for a data set. And it is just a text field at the moment. We had it as a drop down field and it was, as you can see, the earliest we have is uh, 79. So that is uh, a very long drop box. Um, a drop down list of values. So we've put it in as a text field, but we've given an indication in the placeholder text of the values that you can search within. Um, so you can see here it's from 79 to 2085. And this is obviously the test system, so they're probably not that relevant, um, the data in there. Um, but you can just do a temporal search or a temporal range by entering the range as such. Um, if you wanted to do an open or a, a, a an open range, you can obviously just provide a from year or just provide a two year um, in your search. The location tab. So, as I said before, we've incorporated the map search within uh, the general search in Research Data Australia, and hopefully, this is, is going to be quite a good thing. Um, we do have on the cards a collaboration between ANS and TURN um, to improve the map greatly, um, and that'll be coming in a future release. But for this release, just due, due to time constraints with the resources and the project, um, we've put in the, the map that we had before, but um, it will be improved in the future. Um, up the top, you can just get, grab some help for um, drawing a region on the map. 
Um, and down the bottom, there's just a note about not every collection or, or data set within Research Data Australia has um, location coverage. Or it doesn't. They don't all have um, any of these filters. For instance, the only one that is mandatory is a data provider. The rest are optional. So filtering by any of these other ones, you're not going to get uh, the full breadth of Research Data Australia. It's going to be only those records that contain either um, temporal information or um, uh, spatial coverage. In terms of drawing on the map, I've just collected the box tool. So this is the same functionality, functionality we had in the previous version of RDA. I click and then drag to draw, and then it'll give me my little region, and then I can click search. Now, one of the things that I think is really neat um, in this new version is that we provide a mini map with each of your search results when you've done a spatial search. Um, so this provides a real connect between your actual search results and the, search, the, the spatial search that you've done. Um, and sometimes they're quite good, so these ones are quite detailed. These are just static maps that we, we generate through Google, so you can't actually um, zoom in or anything on those maps. But every now and again, you will find the top example is a perfect one. You, you'll see a map where it's just out in the ocean or it's zoomed in so much on a, an area of land, you just get a brown um, space. And obviously, you'll need to go into the record to, to view exactly where that is and zoom in and out on the map. Um, and we'll, we'll try and do something in the future to get an idea of the, the size of a spatial area and the zoom level we need for those static maps. Um, so that's something that we'll be looking at improving in the future. Oh, so the order of filters does make a difference then. Yes, good point. So when I said before, um, there's no predefined order on the actual filters. I mean, you can add them in any way that you please, but obviously as you filter, the available filters on the other tabs will be restricted to your search that you're building. So that's a good point. Clearing a search, so let's just make sure everyone's clear on that one. Um, there's two ways to clear a search. Well, there's, there's multiple ways you can clear a search. The, the quickest and easiest ways of clearing a search is obviously the clear search button in your current search and the, the X that's shown up in your search bar. And that, although it looks like it's just going to search your, uh, clear your search terms, it will actually clear the entire search. So I can just click that and it will clear my search. The other way, obviously, is to click each individual X with the, the items in my current search, but that's a bit tedious. Uh, one thing I did skip over in the advanced search, if you are having any issues, um, there is a tab down the bottom for help, so you can just click on that and access help for the advanced search or for the filters in general in Research Data Australia, um, and then you can click straight back into the tabs uh, within the search to carry on. Now, as I spoke about earlier, um, the one thing that we've really tried to do is focus on finding data in Research Data Australia. Um, so we've kind of hidden away the, the way of searching for party records or grants or services, for instance, but it is still there. So as you can see down the bottom here in the advanced search, there's a drop down button. It's obviously defaulted to data, but then I can use the drop down to go and select the other class types or other object types that I want to search for. So you can still search for people in the same way that you used to be able to, um, but we obviously default to data because that's the main goal of Research Data Australia is connecting people with, with data. Um, but by all means, you can select people. Um, your filters obviously will update to things that are specific to people. Um, obviously, there, there's things like licenses and stuff that don't apply to people. Um, and the same with services and grants. So if I select the grants, it's obviously different filters that are available to the grant search. So the next feature I'll go into is um, my RDA. So this comes into play the, the search results header here, the, the save records and the export at any time. Um, so for this release, we've enabled users to log in to Research Data Australia and save and uh, save records and save searches. So in the, the previous version, we allowed users to log in and they could tag, tag records with keywords. So that's still available for logged in users. Um, but we've obviously extended that to have your own personal space in Research Data Australia um, where you can store things and obviously we'll improve that over time with other features. Um, so you can see this, the check boxes. Um, shown with each of your search results, you can use those to select um, records to save. You can obviously use the select all to save, um, select all the records in your search results, and obviously the number that you're showing on the page will have um, a play in that um, selection. And then I can click on save my records at the top here, so you can see that there's 15 records selected, and I can save all of those 15, um, or I can click the save search button, which will save my current search, which is just the default. Um, search without any terms. So my RDA, the, there is a login option up the top here, my RDA login. And once you log in, you'll see your little profile pic, or if you don't have a profile pic, it'll give you a default profile pic. So you can access the login through there, or you can actually your account 
access your account once you're logged in via this. Um, it'll also prompt you when you go to save records and you're not logged in. So I'll try and save this 15 and it'll tell me that I'm not logged in. Can I please log in? And then I have a, a series of options to log into the, to the portal. So by default, a lot of the users that can, will be coming to the site will be logging in via social media. Um, so Facebook, Twitter, Google, LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn actually shouldn't be there. So it's, sorry, it's the, the top three, Facebook, Twitter, and Google. Um, there is also AAF, so if you're affiliated with an AAF organisation, institution or university as such, the, the login that you use to access the ANS registry is valid um, within the portal as well, so that we share the same login. Um, and if you don't have an account in the registry but you are affiliated with AAF, you can obviously still use that and log in and, and have an account. The other two options which are built in an LDAP, they're, they're more for AN staff um, and we use those quite a bit when we're testing um, the system. So by default we'll be on social and then the AAF will probably be the next most used um, option. So I'll just log in. And one thing to note, it's going to take me straight into my Research Data Australia account, uh, my RDA account, sorry, because I've used the built-in option. If you use AAF or um, uh, one of the social logins, you'll actually be redirected back to the search that I was sitting on before with your selected records. So I'll just go back into a search. It's just because I've used built-in that it takes me directly into my account. So let's say I want to save these two water um, data sets. I've selected the two. I've hit save records. Now that I'm logged in, um, I get the save to my RDA pop out. Now, the first time you come in here, you won't have any two folders. These are, these are because I've actually created folders to store my records in. So the first time you come in, you'll actually have to nominate a folder name of where you want to put these records. So I can say this is water. And I click go, and those two records will be saved. And you can see the available folder, folders have been updated um, to add my new water folder. Now the good thing is if, if I've made a mistake and I just want to move that to another folder, all I need to do is click one of those other folders and my records will be moved into the selected folder. Now you can see that the folder that I created has disappeared and that's basically because it's got no records in it. So one thing to note, if you're moving records and you want that folder to remain, you have to keep at least one record in there. Now once I've saved those records, I then have the option of accessing my account, which is the Open My RDA link down the bottom. But if I wanted to carry on and, and save the search, for instance, I can just close that or click outside that box and it'll close the pop-up. So that's saving records uh, from the search results. Um, the Save Search option works in much the same way. Um, you get a, a number of results for your search shown on the, on the pop-out and then you also have to give your search a name. So we can just say this is... Or search, you click Save Search, and that'll be saved to my RDA. So I'll click into the my RDA account now. That will take you into my account, and you can see that I'm logged in as Joel Ben. Um, this is the default icon that I said. If I was logged in via social media like um, Google or, or Facebook, it'll actually try and retrieve my profile pic to display here and up the top. Um, and then you on the left, you have the Save Searches. Um, and you save records down the bottom. So these are the tables you've got. Now you can see I've got a number of saved searches here. Um, you can obviously do bulk action on those saved searches with the checkbox. So there's a select all, you can select them individually and you'll get a bulk action button at the top here where you can refresh or delete. I'll go into those options. Um, or you can just use the buttons on the individual rows within the table. So if I just want to get ice sheets, I can just click delete, give me a bit of a warning and then I'll drop that that save search. Now, understanding the save searches, uh, there's obviously a, a, some information shown in the result here. So you can see that I had 23,009 records returned when I originally saved this search, so it's saved on the 8th of April. The next line down tells me how many new records have been entered into Research Data Australia since that save date, so 8th of April. And then the last one underneath is going to tell me how many records have been entered into Research Data Australia since I last checked. So let's say over a six month period, there's been a thousand new records that have been put into Research Data Australia, but they've been put in over multiple logins that I've had. I don't want to remember that there was 990. I don't want to remember there was 995. Each time I log in to work out, you know, there's been five added, six added. So we've implemented a refresh option which tells me how many have been added to the system since I last checked. So I log in six months later, I hit refresh, and it tells me, oh, there's 5,753 records. 
Now, next time I come in and I click refresh, this might only show me two. So this is a feature that allows me to check each time I log in, just the new records that have been added, not the new since since I first saved this search. So I don't want to see those records again because I've already checked them. So the refresh option just allows you to check each time you, you come in. Christopher's asked the MyRDA profile image, did you say it draws from social media logons only or is it using Gravatar? At the moment, it's only using social media. Um, and this one is just the default if we can't get something for the user. So obviously there's a built-in login, there's no, there's no profile. So that's the refresh option. Um, Hopefully that's clear. There is obviously help text that goes along with this page. So if I didn't describe that very well, there was help available down the bottom. Um, in terms of checking a search, so I've saved these three searches. If I want to just check the default search that I saved, I can click on the name of the search. So Ocean Levels will rerun that originally saved search. Um, if I want to just check out the new records since it was saved, so the 5,753 records, I can click on that link. Um, if there is obviously a difference between those the since saved and the refresh, so there might just be two records, I can click on that and it'll actually pass a timestamp. I've got one here. It'll actually pass a timestamp um, in with your search and it'll only give you the new records that you've um, since that date. So this is something that uh, I know when we were speaking to the PhD students and they're doing reviews for data and they want to check before they publish um, or, or go forward with one of their projects, they wanted to check if anything new had come in um, and they wanted to be able to use a date to find those records. And so that's one of the features that we've put in through my RDA. Um, underneath that, we have the save records table. Um, so by default, the drop down shows you all of your records, but as we saw, before I've created folders to store my records as a way of organizing them. Um, and you can see that I've got different counts in the different folders. So the ones that I just saved, I think I put into a water records, or may have been water and then I moved them. Um, and I can just select that folder just to view the records within um, that specific folder. Now in terms of actioning, you can obviously move them between folders. Um, so by selecting the checkboxes or just by using the single action, so I can use the checkboxes to do a bulk action, so I can move both of these. It gives you a very similar form to the saving. Um, I want to put them into flood water, you click and it moves. Or I can designate a new folder with the go button and move those records in. And the other options we have is export. So if you use um, EndNote or EndNote Web, you can export a, a reference for the data set over into EndNote. And that's a feature that we had in the past, um, but obviously not through my RDA on the on the view page we've been able to do that. This allows you to obviously go through Research Data Australia, building lists or groups of records, and then export them to your, your reference manager later on. So you can you can do that in a bulk action and then review them. And again, some of the researchers that we spoke to uh, prefer to do that review in their, their reference managers so they can go through, find everything they're interested in, export them over, and then do that sort of review process um, in EndNote or something similar that takes EndNote um, format. Yes, so uh, Katrina's just asked if there's going to be alert functions. So yes, that is one of the features that we had on the list, um, but due to time constraints, we didn't quite get there. But in the future, we'll be looking at setting up alerts, email alerts for um, saved searches. So when new things come in, um, you can get an email to your account. Um, so we're definitely going to be looking at that. And Gerard had a very similar question about setting up um, alerts. Yep, so they, they will be coming in the future. We just didn't quite get there for this release. I think that's mostly it for my RDA, um, well, for the account anyway. In terms of logging out, you have to come to your, your account at this point. So you click on the my RDA link and then click the logout. Um, if you are logged in via social media, there is a little message that pops up underneath that tells you that it's not going to log you out of Facebook. So if you're on a shared computer in a library or something and you've logged in via to Facebook and then log into Research Data Australia. Just make sure that you do log out of your account because there's no way for us to actually tell Facebook to log you out. Um, that's yeah, that's against their policy. So when you log out of RDA, just make sure that you you log out of your other accounts, your social accounts, if you have those open. What I might do is just log in via Google. And then I'll go into the, the view page. So in terms of, of accessing um, information about your profile from your social media account, we only ask for the minimum. So uh, these are the minimum options that we can ask for when we request information from either Facebook, uh, Google, um, or Twitter. So we're not asking for anything above and beyond. Um, sometimes they'll look a little bit sus, but we don't have any control about that. So um, I think the, the the Facebook one um, comes up with an option. Um, I can't remember which one it is. It, you you accept the 
the first set of permissions, then it asks another set of questions, one that it wants to post to your account, and there's a little option down the bottom that says um, not now or cancel, and you don't actually have to accept that one. It's just the first set of options um, that you're agreeing to, and that's just a little sneaky thing that Facebook put in um, to, to try and get you to allow the, the access to their account. So just be aware of that one when that pops up. Um, so as I said, I'm not sure why I can get my profile pic. Maybe I don't have one set up for that. I don't have that one set up for that Google account. Um, so it's just giving me a default Google one, which is confusing. <laughs> it's different to ours. Uh, and then, as I said, there's a note just underneath the log out button just saying that it's not going to log me out of Google if I click log out. And save searches and save records. So in terms of saving um, from an actual uh, collection view, and I'll go into the collection view in a bit more detail in a, in a minute. Um, once you're in the collection view, underneath the go to data provider button, there is a save to my RDA button, and that's basically the same as what we saw in the search results, and that will save this individual record. Um, again, the folder name in, um, order, click go. That'll save that. And you'll see once it's saved, it'll be updated to, to tell you that it's actually saved to my RDA. So that's saving records from the individual view. Um, so I might move on into, there's no other questions there, let me just check. No? I'll move on into the view page, but what I'll do, sorry to be clicking around a lot, is just logging to my other account where I have a saved record as an example. This is definitely one handy feature that I'll be using for these sorts of uh, walkthroughs is that I can save records that I don't have to go looking for um, when I do these sorts of talks. So the view page. So we have obviously changed this quite dramatically um, for this release. Straight away, you can see there is a big prominent title bar. Um, and as I said, we're trying to get logos for all of our contributors just to really um, jazz up the pages a little bit and provide um, some sort of prominence for those uh, data providers. So this is obviously just my default uh, logo for my made up demonstration university. Um, so the title bar, you can see what we're looking at. So we're looking at a data set. Um, so one thing to note, in the past, the, the terminology that we've used on the site was obviously quite confusing to users. It was very much modelled around um, Roof CS. So we had collection services, parties, um, and activities. Um, so for this release, we've really tried to make the terminology clearer to those users who are coming in and have no idea about Roof CS, etc. So we still have some way to go, but I think we're on the right track. Um, so you'll see collections are now called data sets, and obviously data set doesn't always apply to every collection. Um, so we'll be looking at, at enhancing that further with new vocabularies. Um, people and organisations covers the party records. Um, uh, grants and projects is covering activities and services are obviously services and tools. So straight away from the view page, you can see what we're looking at or some indication of what we're looking at. You get the title of the record, um, the data provider. So Demonstration University is the data provider on my setup. Um, where we have no logo, so at the moment the logo on the page is a link to the contributor page for Demonstration University. Where there is no logo, this text underneath will actually become a link to that contributor page. Um, so there's a little bit, um, I guess for an end user, it's a little bit different on, depending on what page they come to. But hopefully when we get logos for everybody going forward, this will be, um, it'll be quite clear. Underneath that, we have all the people um, that are associated with this data set, so related in some way. Um, so as before we had them down the right-hand side, there was a real, again, a disconnect between what those links were on the side. Were they advertising? Did they have something to do with the, the collection, um, with the data set, I should say? Um, and there was no, we couldn't see the relationships without actually previewing those objects. So for this release, we have all the parties, well, the first five parties, I should say, listed out. Um, and their relationships um, shown with those parties to, to really indicate what role they played with the data set. Um, if there are more than five, we'll have a link that says um, see all with the, whatever the count is in, um, and you'll click that and you'll be taken to a search result where you can see all, this, all the parties that are associated with that collection. Now, carrying on for the, from the data centric flow that we're trying to get, when you click on a party name, what we do, instead of going off to a party record, and one of the reasons for this was that we're, we're not a party, or not, we're not a really a, a people portal, we're really around data. So a lot of the people records that we got in were, were blank, or almost blank. We'd have a title and we'd have no other information. So sending a user off to that page is not ideal. You know, It's quite confusing for them to land on a, a record that doesn't have a lot of information. So in, in keeping of the data-centric theme, what we've 
done is we've tried to grab some information about that party from their party record um, and display that. So if there's a little bit of information about Mike, it will be displayed above the contact information. I don't know if Jenny has got some. Yeah, Jenny's got a little bit of information. So we're pulling this out of the party record. Um, then we have some contact information. So it might be that um, the information that to get this data, you actually have to contact a principal investigator or the researchers. So we've put the contact information in these pop-ups, so in case the user wants to contact that, um, that researcher. And then underneath that, we've actually given links to more data from that party. So we're really keeping on that data flow. So Mike Craven here has probably had other things to do with ice. And if I'm interested in this collection about ice contamination, I'm probably interested in other collections that Mike's played a part in. So we give a link of the first five um, collections or data sets that Mike um, has played a role in or is related to in some way. And then we also provide a link um, to go and see all the data sets that Mike's um, related to. And this is really, uh, again, another finding aid, but, aid, but also keeping users in that data-centric flow. Um, in terms of going to see Mike, you can still go to, to Mike's record either via the view record button down the bottom or just by clicking Mike's name at the top and you get a party or a person, I should say, um, view of Mike. Um, and as you can see, there's not a lot of information about Mike by the relationships that he's got to, to other data sets. So I'll just flick back to the data. So by all means, you can still go and see those other object types in Research Data Australia. You can search for them, but we've tried to hide them a little bit and just keep users in, in the data flow. The other things of note in the title bar, we obviously have the share options and we obviously will be expanding those. We've got Facebook, Twitter and Google, um, so you can share these via your accounts. And then we have some stats that get displayed um, to the right of that. So at the moment we have the view stats, so this just tells me how many times this page has been viewed by users. Um, we also have an accessed one, so if I We'll get onto the, the go to data, but if I click go to data, you can see that I now have an accessed count. And this is just telling users how many people have actually used that go to data provider button down here to go to the landing page or go to a service that allows the user to get access to the data or to actually directly download the data itself. So we have three stats. Um, we've got viewed, accessed, and we now have cited. Um, I may have to flick over into production. I'll just let that one run because it's going to take a while because I've got a lot of access. I'll just back into here and move on and we'll, we'll get back to the cited stat. So moving on in the, in the view page, as I spoke about earlier, where we had a very small sort of access link up in the top right, which was sort of hidden away. And again, it was sort of that right-hand column blindness. Um, you weren't sure if it was an ad or just extra information that didn't have a lot of relevance to the collection. So we've tried to, to boost the prominence of the access link and that's this big go to data provider button on the left hand side so it's obviously it's fairly obvious that it's something you need to do um, or can do um, and then underneath that we have obviously the save to my RDA which we've spoken about and the citation option. Um, Natasha's just asked is there still a RIVCS view of records through RDA? Um, we lost that link to view the RIVCS a long time ago because there was a lot of users that um, wasn't relevant to, um, but there is still a link, Natasha, down the very bottom to access the registry view, and that's where you can access the RIVCS. Yes, so it's still accessible, but obviously hidden for the, the general public. And then Susan's asked, does this cited information get sent to data citation reports? Um, good question. I'm probably logged in now. Okay, so in production now you can see this has a citation count of 10. So if I just hover my mouse over that, you can see this has been cited 10 times in all databases from uh, the DCI, so Data Citation in Index from Thomson Reuters. So at the moment, this is a trial service between uh, ANS and Thomson Reuters. Um, it has some way to go. So at the moment, we are pulling back information, we're pulling back the count information from Thomson Reuters, which they obviously have some algorithms behind to determine the actual counts, and we're sort of relying on that. We're working with them to improve their API, so going forward, we will have a link out of Research Data Australia, which allows you to see those cited, uh, those articles or journals that are citing this data. Um, and we also hope to pull that information into Research Data Australia to show it and uh, we'll display it further on in the related publications. So at the moment, there's no citation reports, um, but we will be looking at um, doing reporting later this year for Research Data Australia and data sources, and we'll hopefully that will be one of the things that are included. Um, but there's obviously a bit of way to go with uh, Thomson Reuters to get that sort of up to scratch to give us a bit more information um, about the citing articles. Can you where does aggregated by come from for the info under the title? Um, so I'm assuming she's referring to the test. 
Um, so the aggregated by here is the relationship that is used um, in the RIVCS. So obviously the relationships that we use in RIVCS are sort of camel case and we actually convert them for a user-friendly display. Um, so they won't necessarily be the exact text that you see in the RIVCS relationships, we convert them. Um, and aggregated by is probably collected by, I can have a quick look. Yeah, so it has collector, it's been turned into aggregated by. Um, and if you feel that's not right, by all means drop um, services at, at Anne's an email and we can look at changing those values. Um, these were assigned a long time ago and probably need um, reviewing. So this is uh, so this could be a cheeky option to get data citation accounts for Australian records without having to pay the large amount of money for a TCI subscription. I guess so. Um, obviously, uh, to get the citation counts at the moment, we have ANS obviously has a service where data providers can opt to, to push their records to the data citation index, um, and then we'll we'll try and retrieve that information back to see when things are cited. Um, that's quite a involved process at the moment. Your, your records sort of need up need to be up to scratch for Thomson Reuters to accept them and, and use them in the data citation index. Um, so at the moment, I think we have three or four data providers that are doing that, um, and there's only a couple that actually have citation counts. This one from AAD, um, we knew that AAD had provided the data citation index with data outside of the ANS process, um, so we've done some work to actually um, retrieve the information about AAD. They have the snapshot that AAD has in DCI is actually quite old, so they're missing a lot of DOIs, which really helps our retrieval process. Um, so we're probably going to look at, at improving that process with AAD so that what's in DCI is, is more up to date and we can get those citation stats back. Um, and obviously, as I said, it's a trial service. We'll obviously be looking at expanding this to get figures from elsewhere and, and making sure that you know what we get back is accurate and, and we have the publications available for the end users. I mean, the numbers all well and good. It, it puts some value on this record itself, but as an end user, I really want to see what those those publications are so that I can and do a further assessment on the record. Um, so it, it, it's a good start. Transfers that a lot of the rights license info is currently in the unknown. Is it up to contributors to update records now that emphasis is on access? Yeah, I, I think definitely. Um, we, we really want to be clear about the accessibility and the licenses around data going forward. I mean, the, the real goal is to get data reuse happening. Um, and if the licenses and access isn't clear or isn't open, um, then it's, it's really going to be a struggle to get an uptake on it. So I think that there, there is a real emphasis, emphasis on getting that access and, and licensing right. Yeah, so it's definitely up to the contributors. I mean, ANS can only do so much. Um, if you have a, a license type, for instance, that is supported um, within, uh, within large numbers or within your institution, for instance, we can do some mapping at our end for business. Um, for the display of the business rules. Um, I know that the CSIRO license, they've got a specific license. We've actually mapped that to an open license, I believe. Um, and we can do those sorts of things. Granted, there is uh, large enough numbers or there is a consistent use of that license. Um, but it, at the same time, it is really up to the data providers to make sure that their, their records are licensed and um, the access rights are, are appropriate and sort of in line with, with what we're expecting, I guess. Um, so that's a good question. Um, okay, so I'll move on. Uh, how are we going for time? Can't see the time, but oh yeah, very good. We've still got plenty of time. Um, so moving on, um, the, as I said, there is a big bold go to data providers button that has a number of options, uh, well, a number of uh, features, I should say. Most records in Research Data Australia now have a single access URL, which will most likely go to a university landing page or a landing page on a website which has more information about the data and ways that you can download it or access it. But we also have the ability in RIVCS 1.6, which came out last year, to describe directly downloadable data and also data that is accessible via online services. Um, so if you have a, a data collection which has directly downloadable data or has um, a service um, associated with it that can uh, load the data or access the data for the users. The go-to data provider will actually give some options via a slide down. So most of the times this go-to data provider will just go off to a landing page, but where there are additional options, it'll come in a slide down. Um, you can see the first option here is to access data online via tools. Um, so there is this made up ice contamination requests online. Clicking that will take me off to the service where I can you know, uh, use the data within the tool or maybe even download the data. Um, and the one underneath is download data. So this is a directly accessible um, data set. And clicking on that will obviously download it to my system. 
we have noted that there is some truncation in the formats um, and obviously in the description and we'll be working on that in the future. Um, so that's a known issue. But obviously hovering over it will give you the information about that file or that service. Um, and obviously there can be quite a few here. So one data set might have you know 10 or so downloads and that will obviously expand down to show those 10, 10 downloads. And I can just uh, click that again to, to hide that. Underneath that, we have the site. So uh, I guess referring back to the, uh, the user journey that we were focusing on was the, the search, the filter, the evaluate, and then the access. So I've done my searching. I'm now evaluating the record. So I've got the stats. I've got the description of the data. This is really about accessing. So we have obviously the, accept, the access button to go to the data provider page or to access the data. What you can do, you can cite the data. So we have a citation button, we have the save, and then the information you might want to know or you should know about the data before you go and reuse it or access it. So the cite button, in the past we had the citation information down in the page, um, sort of in, in a block of text. Um, we wanted to make it quite prominent in the access section, so we have a cite button. You click that, you get a pop-out. Um, you can obviously have multiple formatted citations. So the one we have here is in the data site format, which is the default for Research Data Australia. And this comes out of um, when you fill out a RUCS record and you break out all the metadata items for a citation. This is the citation that's built. Um, if you wanted it in your own format, you can use the full text um, citation info element and, and put your preferred citation in there and that will display in here. You can have both, obviously or you can have multiple. So users can obviously just copy and paste this out if they wanted to. Um, and then underneath we have the EndNote options, which we had in Research Data Australia before, and they're still there. So I can export a reference of this uh, data set into EndNote or EndNote Web. Um, and obviously this helped to go all the way along with those options there. So hopefully that's a little bit clearer for users on, on citing records and at least um, getting references to collections to use later. Underneath that, we have the license and rights. So the license and rights can sometimes be quite wordy, um, and we didn't want a lot of distracting text on the on the page. So ideally, this this is an ideal record. We have the access um, label, which is open. So we have open um, restricted and conditional, which we brought in last year. And obviously, hovering over that will give the user a description of what open is um, in terms of Research Data Australia and ends. We then have uh, the CC license. So obviously, we support um, all the CC licenses with a logo. If you have your own um, license type, you will actually just display as text there. Um, you can click on the CC licenses. It will take you off to the Creative Commons website to, to read more about that license um, if you're, you're unsure about what that is. And then all the details of the license and rights is actually hidden underneath with a few details link. Um, and as I said, it could be quite wordy, so hiding it away is, is not a bad thing. Um, and we're hoping that, that most of the time we'll have a couple of labels to indicate clearly the users um, the, the accessibility and the license. And then if they want more information, they can click the view the details and read that. Underneath that, we have the contact information for the record, so that's provided in the RIFCS. And again, it comes down to accessing the data. So not all data sets um, are going to be available online. So there might be things in museums or, or something where you have to con contact the researcher. Um, and in those instances, we really want the contact information up front so uh, the, the end user can use it to contact people. As I said, this is the data site format, so this is their preferred format for citations. You can obviously, as I said, use their full citation, citation info elements in RIFCS to, to choose Harvard um, or APA, and that will be displayed as in your preferred format above or in, in place of this data site citation. Um, we obviously do a lot of work with uh, data site with our DOIs, etc. Um, so we're sort of following that as the default um, for data at, at this time. I've just been advised that we're going to 1.30, sorry. I thought we were going to 1 or to 2, um, so I'll try and speed it up. Um, in terms of the descriptions, obviously they're displayed in the block, in the first block of the page. Um, we have the dates underneath, and then the related information, which used to be over on the right, is now over on the left. And again, we display the relationships with those objects so that it's clear what relation this data has with these other objects. So you can see that I'm associated, this data set is associated with AIMS. Um, it was the output of a certain grant. Um, and again, you can click on these. It'll give you a bit of information about the grant if it's connected to other collections and I want to find out more, find other collections or data sets related to that grant, they'll be listed underneath. And if I wanted to view it, I can click the view record button. 
Uh, one of the nice things that we've done for this release and will be improved further is publications. So where DOI has been used for a publication, we're actually um, uh, retrieving information about that publication from Crossref. So these two uh, publications here, I can click on the name of the publication. It'll give me the full title of the publication, uh, the type that it is, uh, and the publisher for that publication. And also I can go and actually view that publication or review the landing page for that publication by clicking on the View DOI button. Um, and we'll obviously be doing further work with that to try and link those publications to other data sets in Research Data Australia um, and to provide a bit more context around those, those publications. Uh, so that's a nice little feature. Um, the other one that I didn't mention is ORCID. So you, you can still, by all means, use ORCID IDs to relate parties or people to your data sets um, in RIVCS, and they'll be displayed up the top um, here as a, an ORCID party, basically, and it will link that ORCID uh, to their information um, and any collections that are also related to that person. And then moving on, it's basically the same as what we had before. We have a big map displaying any spatial area. As I said before, in the search results, it's a static map, but in here, obviously, you can you can move around and, and zoom out if it is one of those ones where you just get a block of blue, um, and then you can you know, zoom in and move around the, the Google map, change the satellite. Uh, subjects and tags, the same as we had before, you can click on the subjects to do a search for that subject um, for any other records that have that subject. Um, and you can add tags once you're logged into to my RDA. Okay, so in terms of the content itself, it's, it's the same content as we had in the RIVCS, but displayed in a different manner, really focusing down on accessing um, and evaluating the record. The other little feature we have that I spoke about was the similar data sets. So this is uh, used to be called the AND suggested data sets, and we have improved this um, to use a different algorithm to try and find records that are, you know, have something to do with this uh, data set that you're looking at. So we use text, we use relationships to other people, or, uh, grants, we use spatial information, temporal information to try and uh, give you at least the top five um, records that might have something to do with this. And this is just, you know, a nice to have finding aid, similar to like when you're shopping on Amazon or something for a pair of shoes and they'll suggest other shoes that people have bought. So this will this will be something we improve going forward with better and better algorithms um, and using user stats actually. Um, um, they may have liked this record or they may have viewed this record. What other records have they viewed? It might be relevant to a user who's also interested in this data set. So that's pretty much the view page. Quickly go into the grants and projects. So if you're interested in finding um, grants and projects in Research Data Australia, as I said before, we have a uh, almost like a sub portal for research uh, grants and, and projects. So you can either access it by the explore menu at the top here, um, at the grants and projects option here, or you can, went too far, sorry, um, via the option in the explore here, grants and projects. And again, you can also use the drop down in the advanced search to go and search for grants and projects. This, however, will not take you to the home page for grants and, and projects. It'll just take you to a search for grants and projects. So I'll go to the home page quickly, the embedded search for grants and projects. So it has a little bit of information about Australian research grants. Um, the search options have changed, obviously, within the fields that you can search for. So institution and researcher, a bit more um, uh, grant focused. You'll see above the search bar there is a search that's restricted to grants and projects. You'll see this when you switch to any of the other um, object type searches within Research Data Australia via the advanced search, just telling you that this is you're searching just within that object type. Um, and if you wanted to switch back to data as a default, you can just click the X and clear that. But when you're searching for grants, obviously you want to leave that there. Um, you can browse the grants by um, subjects. And there's a little bit of information about the, informa the grant information that we have in Research Data Australia underneath. Um, and at the moment, we only have the two funders providing us grant information. That's obviously going to increase going forward, um, NHMRC and ARC. Um, in terms of doing a search, it's, it's much the same as the default search for data. Just put a search term in and click search. Um, your search filters have obviously changed to be grant focused. So we can select the type of um, activity you want, so a grant, a project, or a program. You can have a look at the status. Um, so we may just want to have a look at active grants. Um, from a certain funder. Um, subjects, managing institutions, so the institution that's managing those grants or projects. The funder of the data, um, so we can just limit it. To, we may just want to look for Australian Research Council um, grants, and we want to look at just closed grants. Further down, we have um, the funding scheme. So within that specific funders uh, schemes, we have the funding schemes that you can narrow down further. 
Uh, the funding amount, so you can obviously put a range in. You want to find grants that are certain between a certain range. Obviously, you can have open um, ranges and the commencement dates. So you may just want to find grants that started in a certain year or between certain years or completed between certain years. In terms of the other things on the page, it's, it's the same as the, the default search for data. Um, the advanced search, as I showed before, has been updated to show the other filter options. But in terms of functionality and how you actually apply filters, it's the same as I've been through before. Uh, good question. So Susan has asked, how often are the ARC and HMRC grants added into RDA? At the moment, um, they're added once a year, um, and this is to do with the agreement we have um, to get the data from ARC and HMRC, and we're working on that um, at the moment to try and get that on an ongoing basis that we can hopefully do every major release, so every couple of months we can update the data. Uh, but it really comes down to what we can actually get out of the funders, and at the moment uh, the data that we're getting is, is annually, but we, we are working on that. In terms of the contributor pages, as I said before, we took away the opt-in uh, feature for contributor pages and now everybody that uh, contributes data to Research Data Australia will have a contributor page. Um, so by the Who Contributes page you'll have either a logo or just a little tile with your name that you can access. But in terms of creating and editing those um, contributor pages, so for data source administrators, apologies to other people who aren't so interested in this feature, you can log into MyRDA with the, your data source account that you log into the registry with, so just same through the MyRDA um, feature. And you'll see on the right hand side, my functions. And this is only for users that have those accounts that allow them to get to the contributor CMS. Um, so if you've logged in, you can click on the contributor CMS. Um, obviously I am uh, an administrator, so I get access to all the contributor pages, but you'll most likely have one, if not maybe two. Um, from the, the listing, you can just select um, one of them. So mine is demonstration university, which takes you into the CMS editor. So by default, the contributor pages that we generate going when uh, collections are first added to Research Data Australia is just a stub page. Um, it might be worth showing one of those at the moment. Um, so Gerard's just asked about comments. So are there any plans to add a comments engine to data sets? Um, yes, we are looking at putting comments into uh, the data set page, so the record view page that people can comment. And again, uh, a way of assessing value um, if there's something, if there's an error with a uh, data set or that, you know, something that somebody had to do to fix it or if there's a new version or something, um, people will be able to comment. So we are looking at that. Uh, next question is from Rohini. Are there any publications arising from a grant listed with grant information? So yes, we're looking at pulling uh, publication information um, back for grants. So if you're looking at a grant view, we're trying to pull back information about any publications that have come out of that grant. So that is something we'll be looking at going forward. So this is a stub contributor page. So this is just the basic contributor page to get. Obviously, you won't have a logo the first time your data comes in. You'll have to upload that. Um, you'll have a title. You'll have the generated text, which just gives the user some information about your content within Research Data Australia. Um, the subjects that you've covered, we give sort of the first 50, and then they can go and look at all of them if they wanted to. Obviously, there's quite a few here. And then links to your data. So if someone's looking at a, a data set that they've found via Google or something, and they want to look at more data from your organization or institution, they can use that logo or that link up in the title to come to this page, where they can then link off to other things from you or your institution. Um, so we have links to some searches for all your data sets, all your services, your people. Um, we're also going to include grants, any grants that your institution is managing. We're going to do some mapping there where people can find grants for your institution. Um, there are organisations and groups um, that are involved within your organisation. Um, and then the last five data records added. So this is the sort of basic page that you get by default. Um, you can then use the contributor CMS, as I was just showing, where you can log in um, to update that page with some, you know, embellish it with your information. So you can add an overview, you can add images. Um, it's obviously, there is a defined template for all the contributors so that they all look fairly similar. Um, but then within those sections, you can obviously enhance them with any of the formatting options um, available. Um, so dot, you can have bullets and, and images. Uh, with most of the sections, a little I, just to give you a little bit of help text about what's sort of expected in those sections for the page. I mean, by all means, you can go nuts, but it's sort of a bit of guidance um, to, to help you fill out those. Contact section, um, and then the one that, that's probably a lot of users are going to want to change and use is the logos. Um, so you can upload a logo just from your file system um, by using the upload button. So just go and select the image you want to use. 
Preferably, we're looking at um, vertically stacked square logos, if possible, um, just because they fit better in the space that we've um, provided in the pages. You can use a, a, a landscape style um, or, or a long logo, but they are going to be restricted to the space that we've allocated, so they display quite small. Um, so where possible, square logos uh, are better. In terms of uploading, as I said, you can just click and upload it and it'll actually upload it to us to our server, so we'll actually host that logo. The other option is just to provide a publicly accessible URL to your logo, um, so it might be on Dropbox or your own server. You can just enter that URL um, straight in the, the URL field here um, and we'll actually pull that back each time a page loads. So it's a little bit slower for the end user, um, but it means you know if your logo changes, you don't have to come here and upload it again. You can just leave it in a, a folder which you just update it at your end or in your Dropbox. One of the funders, I can't remember which one off the top of my head, I apologise, it gives us party information where we actually create a party record or a people record in Research Data Australia that then we link to. So someone can come along and click on that party record and view all the grants. The other funder um, provides it as a text field. Um, so we just list the researchers. Um, we do list it in the search results. We list it in um, and then in the body of the, the view for the record itself. Um, but again, we're working on um, changing that so that we can get more information and link to records. Um, and I know we're, we're definitely pushing for uh, identifiers for those researchers. So ORCID's obviously a big one that we're looking um, to use you know, within the grants. Um, I know AH, NHMRC and ARC are also looking at that. Um, so once that happens, we'll really be able to connect the dots between data, grants, publications, and people um, going forward. So you know, watch this space, that's definitely on the improve. So Katrina's just asking if contributor pages can still be edited in the registry. Um, the answer to that is no. So we've completely um, moved the functionality out of the registry. You will still see it at the moment in the data source settings, um, but it's no longer, um, the contributor pages are no longer based on a party record. We've actually got this CMS which actually uh, builds the record itself instead of using a party record. So if you have a party record in the, in the past that you wanted to use or you have been using, you can copy and paste the information into the CMS um, and, and publish it that way. So there is a help guide that's gone up on the ANS website for contributor pages and it just explains what you can do for those existing party records in the registry. Um, but by all means, this is sort of the only way to, to edit um, and publish contributor pages is via the CMS. So no, they don't sync Katrina. So the logo, obviously, as I said, you can either host or you can and upload yourself. Um, and then once you're ready to publish this page, you just click save. You, by default, won't see the publish button because I'm an administrator, I get the access to publish my pages. You'll see a request to pub request publication button and that will send an email to services um, to review the page just to make sure the content's okay. And they'll contact the data source um, contact for their data source um, just to make sure that the content's sort of been approved because there's sort of sometimes it needs to go through um, you know a director or, or a manager before it can go live and once that um, has been verified by the data source or the editor um, the, the services team will click publish and it'll go live. In terms of if you're a data source administrator and you do need to provide the page to a manager etc you can use the preview link um, Obviously, it'll load the page and how it's going to look in Research Data Australia. It's not visible to other users, but you can share the link, and anybody with the link can sh can view the preview. So, if you wanted to share that with a manager or somebody else who's collaborating on the page, you can definitely share that. Uh, yes, yeah, so Katrina, can I still you uh, embed YouTube videos? Um, so. <laughs> In the past, the editor in the registry allowed a video link. Um, it wasn't supported, um, but it did work. Um, and I know you've used one, and we'll look at um, enhancing the CMS to use uh, the videos as well. Um, there's obviously some issues with the videos um, and how we embed those into pages for them to work with the new template and for security reasons. Um, so there's a little bit more of work that we need to do um, before we can just allow them into the, the contributor pages. Um, by all means, you can put a link um, in your description to that video for the time being and just you know point to YouTube. It's obviously not ideal, um, but we'll, we'll be looking at that. Uh, I know you raised the service ticket, Katrina, we'll be looking at that um, in the next few releases to allow that. Um, but for now, it's, it's not possible. Apologise. Um, in terms of help, just the last thing is just the help and the feedback. So help is always available down the bottom via this button. Um, you will have noticed the first time you went here that this popped up by default the first time, and it only happens the first time we set a cookie in your system. Um, and then you have access to some video overview videos. 
um, and then specific sections on, on the search and my RDA and advanced search. So anytime you can you can access the help there. And then the feedback, obviously, you can send services a ticket quickly and easily if you find a bug or you just want to ask for help um, or if you just have some general feedback about the new site. Or I mean, there's definitely room for improvement. We're not saying it's perfect. Any, any new uh, system or, or product has flaws. Um, so if you find anything, by all means, we're, we're more than happy to have a look at them and, and help you out. But other than that, that's pretty much it, I think. So thanks everyone for staying on. I know it went well and truly over time. And then in terms of any other information that is available on the ANS website, ans.org.au resource slash online dash services news HTML. Um, there'll be some information about the release and what was included and any help and guidance. So for instance, the contributor page guide will be linked up off that help on the ANS website. Um, and any other concerns, just email services at ANS and, and we'll see what we can do.